All right, everyone. So we would like to welcome everyone. Thank you to everyone for joining us today for part one of a two-part webinar series for HIV AIDS awareness. I'm Dolores Brown Austin, and I'll be your main moderator for today's session. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm a community health educator for Planned Parenthood South Atlantic. I work out of Fayetteville, North Carolina. And I've been with Planned Parenthood for six years now. I'm retired military also. So um, that's a little bit about myself, but this series is being brought to you by the Cumberland County Department of Public Health, the Cumberland County HIV Task Force, Community Health Intervention Specialty Clinic, the Fayetteville Alumni, Alumni um, Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, Teen Connections, the Fort Bragg Area Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, and Teens Do Care Incorporated. Special thanks to the representatives from these agencies for contributing to the planning and success of today's event. Okay, so the purpose, let's talk about the purpose of this event. The first National Black HIV AIDS Awareness Day was marked in 1999 as a grassroots education effort to raise awareness about HIV and AIDS prevention, care and treatment in communities of color. This observance is an opportunity to increase HIV education, testing, community involvement, and treatment among Black communities. We recognize that Black people are not a mon monolith, monolith, but a key effort in highlighting progress and resilience for Black people as it relates to HIV is in making issues that affect the community visible. Today, we are providing a space to enhance awareness, reduce stigma, and increase interest to engage in the prevention efforts for communities of color. We'll hear from professionals on current statistics, transmission reduction through PrEP, and hear a knowledgeable panel of experts to discuss how we can be accountable with sexual health, relationships, testing, and support. So the next voice you're going to hear, um, we will hear a few housekeeping reminders from our event planner, Ms. Tamara Morris. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, we'd like to welcome you to this webinar series. This is part one of our HIV AIDS awareness. Um, if you have not done so already, please put your name and organization in the chat. We'd love to see who all is joining us here today. We will pin our speakers throughout today's webinar and for best visual results, we recommend that you use a side-by-side -side speaker view. That's your best way to see all visual supports as well as our presenters. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted publicly following our live stream. All participants have been muted and presenters will unmute themselves during their designated presentations and discussions. We encourage you to please utilize the chat box for any questions or technical assistance issues. I will serve as your chat moderator today and we'll make sure to share those with our presenters. We will do our best to acknowledge as many questions as we can in our allotted time. Um, so please ask your questions and um, make comments in the chat and share your thoughts. This event is sponsored in part by funding from the Cornelia Neal Bullock Wilkins Charitable Endowment Fund for Health of the Cumberland Community Foundation Incorporated. We hope that you enjoy this insightful educational event. Keep in mind that all views and expressions shared today may not be that of the local health department or your partnering agencies, but findings and conclusions are that of the authors and are intended to empower progress and make visible the resilience within Black communities. Enjoy the presentation and back to your main moderator. Ms. DeLois, you're on mute. Sorry, thank you guys. Thank you, sorry about that. So thank you, Tamara, for um, the housekeeping rules. Um, now we will hear from Amicia Ganey-Jones, a communicable disease control specialist with the Cumberland County Department of Public Health. Amicia has over 10 years experience. 
Her role in the areas of HIV provides support as a counselor and coordinator of the, of the Health Department Rapid HIV Testing Program. She's a member of the North Carolina HIV AIDS Prevention and Care Advisory Council. One of her greatest joys is seeing people's lives transform from their application of gained knowledge and preventable health and wellness counseling. She'll share with us where we are now, current statistics and updates to prevention strategies. Welcome, Amicia. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to be with you all on today. Uh, we are so excited about the National Black HIV and AIDS Awareness Day. My goal is to share with you some numbers, some statistics that hopefully it will not be as startling. Uh, it may be startling to you, but hopefully it will be powerful enough or motivating enough to cause you to become proactive and aggressive with your HIV prevention efforts and even your, our intervention efforts, especially as it relates to our community. Uh, you can proceed to the next slide. We're going to be talking about today, where are we now? And hopefully I can uh, just give you some questions to get you, get your, you know, we've come out of lunch, but to really just get you going and to, well, hopefully, you know, Get you just really thinking about some things. I want to challenge your thoughts as it relates to our community as Black and African American people. So since 1981, much has been learned about HIV. And so although HIV is an epidemic, it did not, it did not start out as a Black epidemic. As a matter of fact, it was in the 1990s when CDC took notice of a rise of HIV among racial and ethnic populations. And so as a result of what CDC saw, that's when the funding began. Funding began for intervention programs and funding also began for behavioral health care programs towards minority communities. So the question is, how did we get here? How did we get here as Black African-American people with this HIV now being a Black epidemic. I've got two terms that I want to share with you in just a few moments, just to get you, get you going. And, and, and that is this, accountability and responsibility. Accountability and responsibility. Being more specific, sexual accountability and sexual responsibility. And I'll, sh I'll share with you the reason why I say that. And so we must focus our efforts or our attention rather on these two areas as a black community in order to reduce the transmission of HIV within our community. All right, next slide. So as you can see here, uh, these two graphs here, it's a breakdown of the new HIV diagnosis among subpopulations and transmissions. And this is where you can see that HIV is heavily concentrated among Black people. You can, uh, it doesn't matter how you slice the pie, we're heavily concentrated. Our numbers are high with respect to, uh, in, let's see, I'm to see if I can, within the behaviors of uh, the MSM community. And if you look at the populations, uh, we're just really leading the pack. We're also leading the pack uh, with this epidemic with uh, injection drug use. Next slide. So according to CDC, at the end of 2018, it was estimated that there were 1.2 million people that had HIV. And of those 1.2 million people, 482,900 of them were Black and African-American people. And, and that number still holds true for 2019. So in the retrospect, what we're seeing is that Black, African-American people, our community, we make up 42% of the new HIV diagnosis. If I can, I really want to draw your attention to uh, that area where it's circled in red and you see the black arrows. That particular graph is showing us the trends by the age. 
And, and, and what I, I believe is so alarming about this is when we look at the age group between 13 to 24 years old, we see a decline of the HIV diagnosis, but we see an uptick amongst the, those who are within the age category of 25 to 34 years old. So my question to you is, what are some contributing factors that have caused a rise among both of these age groups, but more so in particular, the age group between 25 to 34 years old? Based on what I have seen, what we see here in the health department, there is not enough of conversation that's being had with this generation, more particularly with this generation that's going to change their beliefs as well as increase the knowledge of the virus. Now let's think about this. We're talking about the inception or the beginning of the HIV virus going back beginning in 1981, okay? And fast forward to today, 2022, we're talking about a brand new generation, a brand new generation in, in particularly this age group here, 25 to 34 years old. Now I'm, in, I'm from the older generation, I'm a 70s baby. And so I believe this, that you know, when, when HIV first came on the scene, AIDS, my generation, we saw the physical manifestations. We saw the effects that the AIDS virus or, or HIV rather had on uh, the effects of disease rather that it had on those who were infected with it. Well, with the advancement of medicine today and all the technology, everything that has you know, improved medical treatment, this generation today, they don't see, and particularly this particular age group here, 25 to 34 years old, they do not see the, the, the physical manifestations of the virus itself or the effects of the disease. That is a good thing. Please don't get me wrong, that is a good thing. And so therefore, we have a generation today within this age group because they do not see the effects of the virus, naturally see it, they are minimizing the threat. They're minimizing the threat. And this is where it is so important and it's key for us to engage. We're engaging in conversation, but we're not engaging enough that's going to change their beliefs. And if we can change their belief, and I'm talking specifically about our community, African-American Black people, our young adults, those who are in college, you know, we've got Federal State University right up the street, uh, the HBCU statewide. If we can get in there and engage in enough conversation with our young, even our young, our high schoolers to where it can change their belief, we can change their behavior. Next slide. So let's bring this home just a little bit more. Right here, as you can see, uh, in the state of North Carolina, we currently have just a little under 35,000 people who have been diagnosed with this virus. And I do want to mention right here uh, with this particular number that it should be treated with some caution uh, due to, and this is due to the pandemic and when we had the shutdown. And so uh, as a result of the shutdown during 2020 and so forth, uh, the numbers are just a little bit low, and that's only because of reduced availability of testing. However, uh, as of December 2020, the, the amount of people who have been diagnosed with uh, HIV in the state of North Carolina is currently 34,963. Of that 34,000, there are 21,501 people who are black that are diagnosed with HIV. And this is across the state. So what we're looking at here, we've got a breakdown where we're seeing 14,000, a little over 14,000 black men, a little over just under 7,000 black women. And then we see the number for the transgender, but this is the breakdown currently of what we have of black African-American people, those in our community that have been diagnosed with HIV. Next slide. So where does Cumberland County rank? How are we looking? What do we look like? Well, currently Cumberland County ranks as the sixth highest county 
in the state of North Carolina with persons that are diagnosed with HIV. So right now we currently have uh, just a little over, we're, we're right at 1,500 and some odd, 1,572 cases of persons that are diagnosed with HIV. Next. All right. So let's talk a little bit about prevention uh, and some prevention strategies right here. Uh, there's still a need. There is still a need for, uh, for at the national level, there's still a need at the state level, there's still a need at the local level. There's a need for all of us, uh, those who are in the faith-based community, our community-based organizations, uh, our social organizations, the Pan-Hellenic groups, there is a need for all of us to collaborate and to work together so that we can address this and we can change the narrative for our community. Look at this right here. This is what I really wanna draw um, in my closing moments here. There, this right here says six in seven people, black African-American people, they knew they had the virus. They knew they had the virus. My question is, what about that one person? What are we doing? What can we do? To, to reach out or are we reaching out to that one person? But I don't want to just forget, you know, just focus on that one person because we still got six other people, six other black African-American people that we can intervene, we can, we can prevent some things uh, as it relates specifically to HIV. And so there are three target areas that we should be focusing our efforts on as it relates to prevention and intervention. I just wanna share a little bit with you in that regards. We're talking about education. We're talking about behavioral health care, behavioral health rather, and we want to look at eliminating and reducing, uh, eliminating some stigmas. And then we want to talk about reducing some barriers. But with respect, before I get into that, with respect of prevention strategies, uh, we're, we're having the conversations and here at the health department, we are encouraging, you know, our, our, the community, our citizens to use condoms because we know that condom use is highly effective for the prevention of HIV. We're also with our young, our, our high schoolers and even, even our college students, uh, but we're also pushing the message of abstinence, 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 when possible. But when abstinence cannot be possible, and let's just be real here, we have to have that conversation because we've just looked at the numbers, but we have to have that conversation about condom use. Also, we are, uh, and as you all may have known, we're, we're pushing PrEP, taking PrEP, and I don't wanna get into that because I believe that's going to come up uh, in our session on today but we are encouraging the use of PrEP because we have seen that PrEP is also highly effective as it relates to preventing uh, HIV. Also here at the health department, we are encouraging uh, rapid testing, rapid testing uh, in person. And, and as opposed to uh, the traditional, we, we do the traditional HIV test where a person can receive their HIV test result and know their status within two weeks. But we also have HIV rapid testing, which is available to individuals who just want to know their status within a few minutes. Now, when we're talking about HIV rapid testing, one of the things that we like to look at here with that particular program is looking at or, or assessing a person's psyche, their mental health, you know, because you're talking about knowing your status with, as, within about 20 minutes, if you will, as opposed to two weeks. So you wanna keep that in mind uh, when it comes to you know, offering or talking about the rapid HIV test. But we do have rapid HIV testing here available uh, to our citizens uh, here uh, at the health department. Um, and also too, something new that the state uh, of North Carolina has launched recently is for those who are not comfortable with taking an HIV rapid test in person, the state has launched a program that's called Take Me Home. And what the Take Me Home program is, it is actually a campaign program that's specifically for rapid HIV testing, but that person who may not feel comfortable with coming into the health department and they, and, or they really just prefer to you know, have that security and do that test within their home, they can go online and order their own 
uh, HIV rapid test. And that rapid test will come in a package where it does not draw any attention because we're all about confidentiality as it relates to that. But they can order that test uh, at the, in the comforts of their home and that test will come to their home and, it, and all they have to do is follow the instructions and then just submit that specimen back to the state of North Carolina and they can get receive their test with uh, their status rather within a matter of days. And so uh, also uh, it, with respect to the Take Me Home campaign, that particular program that the state, of, uh, the state health department has launched Persons who are interested in, in, in ordering that test, they're gonna find that those links on dating apps. Those are on dating apps. So if they're going to oh, the various dating apps, um, they, they can see that campaign and all they would have to do is click that link and, and receive that test and order that test. So that's what we're doing as far as prevention. But with respect to education, educate, educate, educate. We can never do enough of education. We can never have enough of education, especially as it relates to our people. And, and education is about, you know, encouraging, you know, the partners, anyone, you know, that's involved in relationships. Because remember, we're going back, we want to focus on sexual accountability and responsibility. Accountability and responsibility. So at, we have to educate our partners to, you know, have conversations, generate conversations where both parties are going to have open and honest dialogue. And, and also we want to educate those who are involved with creating safe spaces, uh, which is something that's key for our younger generation, our college students, and, and not necessarily the college students because it's just, we're, we're affected across the board, our, our older age population, but we want to create that safe space so that they can talk. So those open and honest dialogues can occur. But the, the, the key, one, one of the keys I believe with uh, educating and creating those safe places or those safe spaces is not, it, it just goes beyond creating the space because we can all create a space. It's about having the right people, the right people that are in there that can have that conversation. Remember we said a few minutes ago that HIV has been on the scene since 1981. And so we have a new generation, a new generation, you know, that are exposed, they're seeing this virus. And sometimes when we're talking about creating a safe space and having conversations and generating, generating discussions with this younger generation, sometimes, you know, uh, it, it, we're going to have to have people that are in that age group, in that category that's going, that can reach to them. We've seen it time and time here over the health department and, and even in your own setting. I'm sure you've seen, you know, some young people, they just want to talk to someone that's close or within that generation, within that age group. With respect to behavioral health, uh, you know, behavioral health is very important as well as mental health. And as we've seen recently, um, over last week with the, the, um, the loss of the young lady, Miss North Carolina, uh, former Miss USA, Chelsea, uh, Chris, we want to focus our efforts on behavioral health and mental health issues. One of the things that we see over here at the health department is that people are dealing with a variety of mental health issues. And sometimes those mental health issues are key components that aid in their behaviors. It aids in their sexual behaviors that they're presenting with. So we want to explore that. We want to focus our prevention efforts on that. Hey, maybe your organization or your group may want to, you know, reach out to the six in the seven and, and focus on the mental health or the behavioral health aspect. Maybe your organization would like to partner with uh, the Cumberland County HIV Task Force or even us here at the health department and focus on that one, you know, and intervene in their area of mental health or behavioral health. And, and so that's the big thing. Our be if we can focus our efforts on their behaviors, first, we got to change their belief about the virus because when they don't see the virus and the effects of it, they, they don't see the virus as a threat. And so they don't bother with changing their behaviors. And so lastly, uh, we want to eliminate stigmas. We want to eliminate stigmas and we want to reduce barriers. We want to reduce barriers to care, which affects retention in care. And it also affects adherence to their treatment, which is very critical to viral suppression. Within our community, our, our, our patients who are HIV positive, we have a low rate of, of patients who are 
whose viral load is not suppressed. And, and we want the viral load to become suppressed because they won't be able to transmit that virus. Uh, but when you have factors in place or social determinants in place, such as unstable housing, when there's uh, concerns such as transportation or lack thereof, when there's concerns or stigmas or barriers such as uh, medical distrust in the community, concerns about paying for PrEP, uh, medication storage, or even access to providers, this is where we're going to see those barriers and we're, we're, they're not, our, our, those within our community who are HIV positive are going to have issues where uh, it's, it's going to be challenging for them to become virally suppressed. And so I've said a lot here, you can go to the next slide. Um, I've said a lot, our whole goal, you know, since we're talking today is about changing the narrative in our community. We can change the narrative. As I stated in the beginning, this virus, it didn't start out, we didn't start out with it being a black epidemic, but however, through behaviors and so on and so forth, now it has become our issue. And it's not just one person's issue, it's all of our issues. And I believe that when we all work together and collaborate, we can change the narrative for our people. Uh, if you would like some more information about how you can test or or, or you know, even coming over to the health department so that you can uh, have an HIV test done, please get in contact with us. Uh, my phone number is here on the screen. It's 910-433-3641. We test Monday through Fridays uh, on our adult health STD clinic. We will be more than happy to help you and answer any questions that you may have concerning HIV and AIDS. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Amicia. Um, Amicia also has her um, email address in the chat if you would like to get in contact with her that way. Um, now we will hear from Ms. Eva Barrett. Eva Barrett has a BA in English and spent 12 years in the nonprofit community-based arena in case management, managed care, testing, education, and prevention before going to corporate employment. She has returned to the nonprofit community-based sector as the program manager with Community Health Interventions Incorporated. Eva has three boys, 21, 15, and 14, who are all student athletes. Go Winston-Salem State University Rams, TS Bulldogs, and MA Panthers. Welcome, Eva Barrett. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm a little hoarse. There's basketball game recently, so that's why I do apologize. Um, I did want to let everybody know in advance, our phone number and our fax number are on the screen. If you wanted to call to ask about information as far as getting any of your patients or clients um, enrolled in PrEP, you can go ahead and call us or fax over a referral. If you have questions as far as what is needed for that referral, again, just go ahead and give a shout out and um, we'll give you all the information that you need. We'll work hard. Um, to get them what they need and get them set up. Uh, next slide. So I'm gonna give a little bit of a background on what PrEP is. I'm pretty sure everybody is pretty knowledgeable about it, but I just wanted to make sure that we discuss that pretty quickly. Um, PrEP is pre-exposure prophylaxis. It is a daily medication that people at risk for getting HIV can take to prevent themselves from getting HIV from sex or IV drug use. I do wanna let you know that there is a new medication that has just been approved in December of 2021, and it changes that from a daily medication. We'll talk about that uh, a little bit later. Um, um, according to the CDC, PrEP reduces the risk of getting HIV from sex by approximately 99% and from IV drug use by approximately 74% when it's taken as prescribed. I have that in bold because I do wanna talk about adherence. Just like any other medication, um, these medications only work to their highest effectiveness if people are taking it as prescribed. We do have to understand the fact that um, sometimes people forget it. the daily medication sometimes is difficult to remember. And so when that happens, it can reduce um, the effectiveness of the medication. So I do want to give you a little bit of a highlight on that. If you think back um, for lots of ladies, I think, probably in my age range, when you start thinking about um, the pill and effectiveness 
And if you forget a day, or you remember a day, that child may now have an age and a name, okay? So when we talk about effectiveness as far as preventing HIV, there's also a time where you can um, identify when that transmission may have happened because you may have forgotten to take your medication as prescribed. Next slide. So who is PrEP available to? Who can take it? PrEP is basically available to everyone who is HIV negative and at risk in, more, in one or more of the following risk categories. They have a partner who's HIV positive. They've been recently diagnosed with an STD. They have unprotected sex and engage in IV drug use. I do want to add a note to that. It is for adolescents and adults who weigh at least 77 pounds. It's not for every single person, but almost everyone can take PrEP, okay? Um, all patients who are going to take PrEP should be tested for HIV, and they do need a negative HIV test to be able to be on PrEP. We do offer PrEP here, and one of our requirements is that they retest every three months. Um, they also should be tested for Hep B, and their kidney function should be monitored because as with some medications, there can be effects on the body, and one of the effects for PrEP could be that it may reduce the function of your kidneys. And so as long as we are monitoring that every three months, we're doing those tests and we're monitoring, monitoring that our provider is, and just ensuring that there hasn't been any great change in their kidney function. And if it is, then we would need to address um, changing that prescription or looking at other options. Next slide. So the next question would be, once people understand that PrEP is available and what it is, is what types of medication are available for PrEP? Currently, there are three uh, types of PrEP or medications for PrEP available. Like all prescriptions, they can cause side effects. So it's best to discuss with your provider which one is best for you, for the patient or for your patients. They do need to have conversations with the provider. We do provide a questionnaire. And the reason why we provide that questionnaire is because that helps us better, better understand that patient and what medication might be best for them. So the three types of pres PrEP prescriptions that are available at this time are Truvada and Discovi, which are manufactured by um, Gilead, and Apertude, which is that new injectable um, PrEP, which we're gonna get into a little bit further, and that is by manufacturer Vive. Um, you'll notice that I did provide the manufacturer names, and the reason why I did say that is because um, one of the barriers to PrEP is the cost of it. It is expensive. And a lot of the manufacturers and providers do actually um, provide medication and copay assistance. Because even sometimes people who have insurance, the copay is still extremely expensive and can remain to be a barrier for people being able to take PrEP. So I added those in case you guys wanted to go to their websites and look at those applications. Um, when people do come to us, one of the things that we do do is ensure that those applications are filled out and signed in advance, depending on what they may end up getting. And if we need it, then we can send it and get it done. Okay, next slide. So Truvada is one of the first PrEP medications that was out there. It was initially used for HIV um, treatment, but it is, uh, I think in yeah, 2012, it was used for uh, PrEP. Um, according to the CDC, Truvada is the only PrEP medication approved for women um, until a pre, uh, Apertude came out. So women can also use Apertude, but Truvada has been used as treatment for HIV, HIV, but has been approved by the FDA in 2012 for PrEP. Next slide, please. Discovy is a medication. It's also a daily pill like Truvada um, that is for anybody who is at risk for having HIV sex. I mean, for, for at risk for HIV through sex or IV drug use. The, FI, the FDA has not approved the use for Discovy for those assigned female at birth. And this is mainly for men who have sex with men. Okay, this medication was approved in October of 2019. Next slide, please. Um, these are just some common side effects for Discovy and Truvada. And being that Discovy and Truvada are created by the same manufacturer, it does appear that what that manufacturer was doing was taking a look at um, 
side effects and things that patients were complaining about and issues, and they made an attempt to improve upon its um, outcomes. So some of those side effects are diarrhea, nausea, headache, fatigue, and stomach discomfort. Next slide, please. The new kid on the block is APRA2. This one is basically addressing adherence. When we talked about it earlier, I did mention that if you forget to take a medication, um, it can affect the effectiveness of the medication. Uh, according to the CDC, Discovi and Truvada are only um, as effective as you are ineffective as being adherent with that medication. So you have to have prep in your body for seven days before it is at its most highly effective at um, minimizing your opportunity to contract HIV. And that is for um, anal intercourse only. For uh, vaginal insertion and IV drug use, it must be in your system for 21 days before it is at its highest effectiveness. So adherence is extremely important. What happens when Apertude comes onto the scene is that it is uh, once a month for the first two months. And then after that, it's every two months and that it is longstanding and it is in your system and it's ready to be able to be effective. Again, even with pills, just like, uh, even just like with pills, you have to have adherence to Apertude. You have to get your injections on time. You have to be consistent with it. Otherwise, it reduces your ability, the, the drug's ability to be effective. Next slide, please. The side effects with the injection are a little bit higher than they are with um, Discovi and Truvada, which are the once a day pill. But again, just like with other medications, this is a new medication. These are new things. This was just approved in December of 2021. Um, so you do wanna take into account that these things are possible. Um, I do want to mention at this point that um, we're still not sure when Apertude will be available to be prescribed. At this time, I am on an um, a email list where I am waiting to receive information as soon as Apertude is available. Then I want to get my hands on it. I want to get you know, all the information that I can. I already have all the dosing, all the provider information, which we are providing to our provider. We want to be in the know. We want to know about it for people who are considering it as an option. There are people who are on the once a day pill prep and are not compliant. It is costly and it is not helping them if they're not taking it. So we have to weigh those options and have those discussions with our patients with the side effects in mind to see which ones are, are the most, um, are going to be the most effective for them. Next slide. So at this time, I did want to uh, remind everyone that Community Health Interventions does provide um, PrEP medication. We are accepting new patients for PrEP. Um, we do get a lot of referrals from the health department, from Cumberland County Health Department. So thank you very much. We are working with all of those referrals. And um, if anybody has them, again, just go ahead and look back at the information. And if you could watch this video on uh, with providers and how they address uh, PrEP as an additional prevention, not the only prevention, but as an additional prevention. Because PrEP is not the cure-all, it's not the answer to everything. We still want them using condoms. We still want them educated on limiting partners and being careful. So here's the video. When I talk about PrEP, I talk about it as being one component of HIV prevention. And when I have conversations with my patients around their sort of general prevention care, we look at the whole picture. How many sexual contacts are they having? What kind of barrier methods are they using? Are they having conversations with their partners or contacts about their testing? And really making sure that they understand that PrEP is one piece of their general prevention care. And I always want to get a sense from patients, you know, what do they know about it? What have they heard? Um, you know, what are their concerns? And so really um, helping to, you know, provide information and support them in their decision of whether to take PrEP or not. So it's really working with um, the patient to understand, you know, what's their daily routine. The other misconception that I, I hear a lot about potential side effects. 
the vast majority of people that uh, do well and have absolutely no problems. So usually when I talk to people about PrEP and the potential side effects, um, I, I try to explain to them that you have the same potential side effects whether you're taking anti-inflammatories or you know medications that you use to treat a fever or other kinds of medications. But it's hard as a clinician because we have to fight social media and major media, which tends to get their attention uh, more persistently than we do. They're just coming in for a quick office, office visit, but you can't turn off Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat and all the uh, you know, misconstrued information that you get on that. So it's, it's tough to fight that, but that's, what, that's part of the job. You have to take your time to do that. Okay, uh, thank you for that. And I did wanna let everybody know that if you have any questions, you can go ahead and ask at this time. I'm not sure how good on time I'm doing right now. You're good, Ms. Barry, you've got about four minutes. All right, thank you so much. If anyone has questions, we had our fax and um, phone number in, on the presentation. I'll go ahead and put it in the chat along with my email if you guys wanted to go ahead and send any information or just say, hey, because I see some people out there that I haven't seen in years and that uh, we, we've got some information. So, hey, everyone, I hope everyone's doing well. All right, thank you so much, uh, Eva. Now, um, we will move on to our panelist discussion. Moderating this session is Christina Washington, RPH. Ms. Washington is a retired clinical pharmacist and business owner and has been active, an active member of the Fayetteville Cumberland County community for more than 30 years. She is a member of the Fayetteville Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. Her pharmacy career and specialty in compounding medications, including antivirus suppression, Suspension is so impressive that we could not fit it all in this introduction, but we want you to read more about the impressive works and her service to, pe to people throughout the years. Tamara is providing the link in the chat to read more about her accomplishments and work in the community. She is a previous board member with the Board of Health and has been previously issued the Legacy Award from the Cumberland County HIV Task Force. Without further ado, please welcome, 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 Mrs. Christina Washington. Thank you guys for your patience. We're gonna reload Ms. Washington's video. Give us just a second. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Yes. I don't know. Uh, I'm sorry, but the, as soon as she uh, finished with her discussion, it just knocked me completely off. <laughs> Um, so we, there's technological events that have been happening here, so we'll go on. So right now, what we're going to talk to is some individuals on our panel. Uh, first one is going to be Dr. Jobin McLean. Um, Dr. McLean is also known as Dr. J. He is a medical case manager living with HIV undetectable who also serves his community as an elder, a pastor. Dr. J earned a doctoral degree from, in pastor theological from Andersonville Theological Seminary in Camilla, Georgia. Dr. J is a grant writer, licensed missionary, chairman to the Cumberland County HIV Task Force, and vice chair of the North Carolina Regional Quality Council for HIV. 
Dr. J is happily married to his loving husband, Dante. We also have on the panel, uh, Dr. Robin Peace. She's a family medicine provider employed by UNC Health Southeastern at the North Lumberton Medical Clinic and currently serves as associate director of the Southeastern Hospital Hospice Health and medical director at Woodhaven Nursing Alzheimer and Rehabilitation Care Center. He has been caring for people living with HIV since 2009 and is certified by the American Academy of HIV Medicine. Because of her interest in community health and wellness, she frequently speaks at churches and community events. She likes to be referred to as preacher of health. Her goal is to educate and empower the community on the importance of making healthier choices. And our third panelist is Dr. Linda Battle. Dr. Battle is board certified by the American Nurses Credentialing Center in Public Health. Her dissertation topic was barriers to face-based primary prevention of HIV and AIDS in the communities of color. Her research interests are health disparities in communities of color. She's been a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated for almost 36 years. Thank you for being on our panel today. Well, Dr. McLean, we're gonna ask you for talk about what do black people need to know about HIV and AIDS? Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Washington, for that great introduction. Can everybody hear me? Is that like, give me a thumbs up, at least. A little muddled. It's muddled. Uh, <clears throat> all right, right, let's see if I can fix that really quickly. I'm sorry. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that better? No. Oh, my. <laughs> OK. Um, that's just, I'm going to try something else. Um, but anyway, uh, let's start with some ideas and then we'll try to get it fixed and we'll try to move on. I couldn't understand. Okay. Let's go to the next person and, and so he can try to get that um, cleared up because we can't understand what it is he's saying. This is for Dr. Peace. Who can a newly diagnosed individually go to locally for primary care? Yes, thank you. Uh, and thank you all for having me this afternoon. Um, I would like to think that someone that has HIV could go to any primary care provider and receive uh, primary care treatment. Um, I, I think that even though I'd like to think that there may still be some providers that um, would rather not see someone that is infected with HIV, that makes no sense to me because um, HIV is a chronic illness and uh, they may have a provider that's treating their HIV, but beyond that, I take care of my patients with HIV and meet their primary care needs the same as I do my uninfected patients uh, with HIV. Uh, so again, I, I'd like to think they could go to anyone uh, because the primary care is the same. Um, I actually would like to see more primary care providers treat HIV. Um, I uh, teach medical students and residents and I'm encouraging them that are going into primary care to learn to take care of their own primary care patients if they become infected with HIV. I think the best medicine or the best health care for uh, patients that are infected with HIV is to have all of their health care needs, including managing their HIV. Uh, I, I think it, it's important that they're managed by that provider as opposed to referring them to a stranger to treat just the HIV. All right, that sounds good. Um, some of the things that um, we saw on the last slide, uh, as far as when we talked about side effects of medications, 
when a person presents to you with all of these things going on with them, um, it, it may be that the primary care physician that they go to maybe miss the diagnosis of HIV and AIDS. What do you think about that? I guess I can answer that. One thing that I like to say to, to patients or when I'm meeting with people, are you positive that you're negative? The only way that you're going to know that you're positive is, you, is if you actually take a test. It's the same thing with diabetes or anything else. Um, one thing with African Americans within our population, we are known as late testers. Late testers means that from six months to a year after your initial um, diagnoses, you have full-blown AIDS. Uh, we know the latent phase can be up to eight years. So if people, you know, usually after infection, it could be a couple of weeks, they might feel some minor flu symptoms, and then they're not going to feel anything. So if they don't know that they're positive for those eight years, what do you think could be happening if they're not um, taking all precautions? They're passing it on to every to others. But for some reason, we tend to be um, very resistant to testing. Um, and I just think that people, we need to encourage people to go ahead and test because um, H, what does HIV look like? HIV looks like me. Just because I'm an African-American woman, I'm 40% um, more likely to um, have HIV than my um, Caucasian counterpart. So um, I think we just really need to talk to people about testing. How do you know? Because everybody's walking around, I'm not HIV positive, I'm not HIV positive, but you don't know unless you actually test. Right. I would also, I'm sorry, I'd also like to add to that just to say, um, you know, patients that know they're at risk um, and, uh, and a lot of patients that uh, end up becoming positive for HIV, many of them do know that they are partaking in risky sexual behaviors, if you will. Um, sometimes it's missed by the provider because the provider doesn't know that they're taking care of a patient that's at risk of being infected with HIV. And I mean, I certainly encourage uh, the students and the residents that I'm teaching to take a good sexual history uh, as a part of a complete physical, but it would also help providers for patients that know they are partaking in risky behaviors to share that with whoever they're seeing for medical care. I, I, you hit, touched on a very interesting point is that when the person comes to see you as a primary care physician, that that should be part of all of that information that we fill out that we make those check marks does your do you have family history of heart attack and all that other stuff but to get a complete sexual history because you don't know that person and that and that's a good answer uh let's go back to dr mclean um do you think he's yes, cleared up yes ma'am can you hear me well now i can hear you loud and clear so wonderful what do you think, your question for you is what do you, what do black people need to know about hiv and aids um, I, I'm, I'm so glad that you asked, and, and I apologize for the sound earlier. Um, you know, I think that our um, presenters earlier did a very, very good job um, introducing um, a lot of the HIV 101 things, but I want to reiterate, um, Dr. Jones shared that 42% um, that of our Black and African American people make up the HIV population, um, you know, and just the numbers that she was sharing as far as the breakdown. Um, and then um, our last presenter um, was talking about um, PrEP and how important it is. And I think that it is so important to remember that HIV is affecting our community. Um, she shared some numbers, um, Dr. Jones shared some numbers as well about North Carolina in general, but right here in Cumberland County, 1,500, um, yeah, 1,572 uh, cases. And we're the sixth in, um, highest county in the um, in the state. I think that is very important to mention. And just, just being honest, um, and I don't mind being uh, sharing that I am a person living with HIV who is undetectable. Um, and for the longest, um, you know, let's be honest, sometimes in the midst of our um, sexual behaviors, we can be very safe. 
Um, but then you have that one time where you decide to not be safe or those few times that you decide not to be safe. I think it's important to remember that, you know, um, if like uh, Dr. Peace was saying, if you are having risk behave risky behaviors, use protection at all times. Have those conversations and be honest about that, um, you know, um, and, and, you know, just making sure that we keep in mind that this is a disease and, and no matter how much you may be thinking that, you know, it can't happen to you or it might not happen to you is it's never really real until it hits home and that's i'll stop there well i'm going to give you this other question i think you can probably answer the best when should an hiv positive person disclose to an intimate partner that they're hiv positive okay um so you give me a you give me a good question um this one is a um this one is a it's twofold, if you will. Um, I, I like to definitely um, talk about U equals U. Um, and when I see U equals U, that means anyone that is undetectable um, is also untransmittable, meaning that they have reached an undetectable status, um, less than 20 copies um, in their viral load that the state says that they can live up under what's called undetectable equals, undetectable equals untransmittable. What that means is, is if you have been in care with your doctor for, um, you have been in care with your doctor, you have been on your medication as you're supposed to, and you have maintained that undetectable status for at least six months to a year, the state says that you no longer have to disclose to your partners um, if you meet those requirements, let me be clear. However, if you do not meet those requirements, if you are newly diagnosed, um, it, and if you are not um, virally suppressed, undetectable, you are supposed to share with your partners, your sexual partners when having sex. Um, I, I like to give some uh, roundness to that. You know, um, people are always, of course, afraid about having their business told, afraid about stigma. Um, and I think, number one, that we have to remember that at the end of the day, if you are not undetectable, that there is a very good likelihood um, that you may transmit. And so you need to be honest with your partners. Um, and I think um, Dr. Jones was talking about this earlier, accountability and responsibility. It, I, I feel like, you know, although U equals U isn't in place, um, there are just conversations that need to be had. I think that use safe sex is the best policy um, because at the end of the day, um, if you don't have safe sex beyond HIV, there are other things that are transmittable that you still cannot get rid of. You have herpes out there, syphilis is a bacteria that remains in your body, you know, and this goes on. So I think it is so important um, that you have conversations and, and disclose um, when, it's, when it's necessary. Now, Tamara, you might need to jump in because on mine, I think it said that Dr. Christina might have got knocked off for a moment. Sure, no worries. Um, we can continue this conversation and get some more information from our expert panelists. And once we get Miss um, Washington back in, we'll be sure to allow her to continue this great moderation. Um, but for our next question, um, why do you think there is continued stigma surrounding HIV in the Black community? And I'd actually like to hear from each of the experts here. I think I could start on that. One of the is not only just HIV, it's sex in general. In our population, in communities of color, we just don't have that candid conversation. I'll be honest, I, I, my dad was a pastor. I come from a family of ministers. I was 29 and married when I had my son. But if my mother asked me where he came from, I'm like, oh, no, we just don't have those candid um, type conversations. And what I encourage um, people to do is have those conversations with your children. And I'm talking starting early. I don't know how many, I, as, as a nurse, I work labor and delivery, and I don't know how many 11 and 12 year olds that I delivered their babies. So we need to start earlier. If you had, and I always call it that whoopsie, if you had a whoopsie to get pregnant, well, that same whoopsie could lead you to be HIV positive or to have another STI. But um, 
we as a community, we need to be able to have those candid conversations with our with our youth and starting um, with our youth. Um, I, I always embarrass my son um, because he was younger when I first started working in HIV and he used to go to all of my talks. And um, I, I just, you know, I didn't know he was paying attention. He was usually in the back playing on a video game. Um, but I was very proud of, of my son that he was able to come and talk to me. I didn't want to, you know, I was kind of embarrassed. He's like, well, you talk about every, he said, you talked you talk about it with everybody else. Why can't you talk about it with me? So at age 17, my son put me in check. And so we had to have that conversation. But I think as adults in our community, we need to be able to have those candid conversations. Thanks, Dr. Battle. Um, we'll go to Dr. Peace and then Dr. McLean. Um, Ms. Washington was able to join us back. And so um, I'll let her lead um, the charge after this question. Yeah, so why, why is there still a stigma? You know, knowledge is power. And uh, we just have, we're undereducated as a community, as a Black community, about the impact that HIV is having uh, on, uh, on our people. Uh, you know, people, if you don't know someone, if you're not HIV positive, if you don't have a close family member that is HIV positive, then you, you very well may not know the the impact that it's having on us you know you if it people are still thinking that hiv is a disease of of gay people and iv drug users and sex workers where you know as someone said earlier hiv looks like me uh you know and everyone needs to know their status you know people don't see themselves as being at risk but I, what, I, what I tell patients that I see, if you have ever had unprotected sex and you've never had an HIV test, then you don't know whether you're HIV positive or not Absolutely. until you, till you get tested. So, you know, uh, people just don't see themselves at risk. Uh, I'm in Robinson County. I'm in Lumberton. I'm right beside uh, Cumberland County. Uh, and I've been taking care of, of patients, you know, for the last 10 years plus. I just asked my one of my case managers the percentage of African Americans that we have because I honestly didn't know. Um, but she said 58% of the patients that I see are Black. Uh, and I have over 250 patients that I am currently managing that's living with HIV. It is one of the most rewarding aspects of my practice uh, because it's, it's, uh, it is an opportunity for me to impact the, this issue in a way that I couldn't as a physician before I decided to do it. And if I'm honest with uh, all those that are listening, when I first started out in family medicine, I had no inclination to treat HIV. It was only because I worked for a community health center that had a Ryan White program that uh, we were already taking care of that population. Uh, and when the opportunity came, um, I decided it's time for me to start doing this, uh, you know, because if it's in your heart to serve, then that should just not be one area. You, we need to open ourselves up to serve in all kinds of areas. And so um, we need to increase the education of the community. That's the bottom line. You know, people just don't realize there's still people that think you can get HIV from using the same fork as someone else. There are still people that believe that, that you can get HIV from kissing. There's still people that believe that. So it's a stigma because people are undereducated. I just wanted to add one thing. Like I said, my, my doctoral work was looking at um, d going through the faith communities. And I know we have a lot of faith leaders on there. And one thing that a Bible verse that has been the background for my work and what I, what I speak to when I talk to faith leaders is 3 John 1, 2. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. So it, it's one thing, you know, your soul is, you're doing everything for your soul, but if your body's not right. So that's what I look at the faith leaders to set me 
the example and actually reaching out to their communities. And especially, like I said, I do a lot as far as women's advocacy. And if you look at the average African-American church, which is the majority of, of women, you have a captive audience right there to have these candid discussions. And I know as a public health person, when I was talking, I, I would want to do, you know, I want to do blood pressure screenings, fine. I want to do diabetes screenings, fine. I want to come and talk about HIV. I wouldn't even get a call back. Yeah, so I'll jump in. Um, you know, as you think of, as we think about stigma um, and we think about, you know, how it affects people, I think of it in um, two ways. Of course, you know, uh, Dr. Peace and um, Dr. Battle did a great job explaining how you know, misinformation, people just not knowing and, and having wrong conceptions. Um, and not only that, I think a lot of times, um, just if I could piggyback off the comment about our faith communities, I think that a lot of times if our faith leaders would realize that number one, you are always called to be a social justice and an advocate, um, you, are to, you are to always preach and speak up for the oppressed um, and the people that are done injustices. I, I, that's the only way that I can say that broadly. And it goes beyond what you feel like people's personal sins or marks of disgrace are, because that's what stigma is, is a mark of disgrace. Um, you know, and so Dr. Uh, Battle read that scripture and I was like, oh, see, she's going to make me feel real preachy right now. <laughs> um, but, you know, sincerely, um, if we could see that this is this is a human issue, first of all, and then that not only is it a human issue, but that it is affecting our Black and African American and people of color um, communities so much far beyond what is affecting other cultures and communities. I think that that then would move us to do something when we view it from a social justice and an advocacy um, standpoint. Um, but not only that, you know, I think of the stigmas that people per perpetuate within themselves. Cause let's be honest, when people find out that they're HIV positive, there are so many internal stigmas going on. They don't, you know, I don't want anybody to know that that's what I'm at the clinic for. Oh my gosh, I have to take this pill for Forever. Oh my gosh, I'm going to be alone forever. And a lot of times people that are living with HIV are so misinformed. And I think that, you know, um, I think somebody was talking earlier and they said we have to get away from just the conversation, uh, not generalizing it, but going further with actually moving to action uh, of saying like, hey, how can we get into our, um, and, I, and I'll just say this because I've seen them comment, how can we get into our city council meetings? How can we get um, into our, um, into our, um, our um, uh, council, uh, our, our, uh, other meetings that are going on with our cities, um, you know, our county meetings, how can we get in on this and find out how we can be more involved so that in our cities, in our counties, people are being more educated, but not just educated, they're actually being challenged to do something, um, you know where we're really, really pushing to say, hey, in our area, we want to see testing. You know, we've seen it done on many occasions. I think in Canada it was, um, or even the UK, one of the princes decided to get tested openly, um, you know, publicly. I think if a lot more of our council people and a lot more of our, um, our mayor or anybody else, our faith leaders, if they would say, hey, I'm going to go get this test and show the people, you know, let's be honest, in our Black community, we follow our leaders. Let's be straight up about that. And the majority of us follow our faith leaders. And so, you know, if we could see um, some lead ways in that where our faith leaders are getting more active, where um, those of us who do have the voice in the black and brown community my gosh if you're an advocate and you're living with hiv open your mouth listen the worst they can do is know that you have hiv and that you're living a thr and thriving in life um you know if i hadn't told you that i was hiv positive you couldn't look at me and said hey that guy living with hiv you wouldn't have known unless i told you and even since then you know just seeing um the continual blessings of god or um and the continued success of life um i can honestly speak for me i'm I'm gonna shut up after this. Um, I had some of those same stigmas whenever I first received diagnosis. However, just educating myself and, and not only that, remembering that, you know, the scriptures promised me that I was gonna live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. You know, um, those things helped me to be, uh, um, have a more positive outlook 
about a positive status, if you will. Um, and so as I as I trans as I trans um, moved along and and continued along in this journey, I found that um, the more I became educated, the more I began to make my face a known as an advocate. There were so many other opportunities um, that were open for me. I serve currently as the chairperson um, of the Cumberland County HIV Task Force. So there are so many opportunities that can be made for people that can be made in our communities if we would just press past the stigma. I'm stopping. Ms. Washington, you're muted. Okay. Okay. How do we, how do, but doctor, wait a minute. Ooh. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. You got an echo. You're muted again. That the people that we we're looking after are between 25 and 30, 34 years age. So how do we improve addressing the needs of that black community to promote prevention and uh, uh, getting tested versus what they see in the media on the TV and social media? I think I might start on that one. One thing um, that's been kind of disheartening to me is we're not seeing it on TV and social media like we should. Today is National Black HIV Day. I haven't seen a commercial, and I, I'll be honest, I, I, I watch the MTV, the VH1s, those are the channels that that age group is watching. But we mentioned earlier talking about a safe space. We have to be comfortable going in, talking to them. I go into the colleges and speak. When I go to the college, I'm not wearing a suit. I'm wearing my sneakers or my Timberlands and a sweatshirt. I want to be like them so they're more comfortable coming <coughs> and talking to me. If we are comfortable speaking <coughs> and kind of speak matter of factly, they're going to be more comfortable when they come to us. Yes, I, I think you're right uh, in that trying to get a hold of that um, that that target audience. I want to mention that I had gone to a, a pharmacy convention and a young man had a poster presentation and he was all gun ho about all of the the treatments that they were for you know so you could be undetectable and and the way he presented this uh, was that oh. And I think for young people, it's like this. If I get it, all I have to do is to take a pill. And, you know, I can take a pill every day, even though I might have risky behavior, um, you know, that kind of thing. And so how do we address that part of educating the young that I'm, I'm old enough and I was in practice when the HIV uh, community really started and when the pills came out where they were taking maybe 30 something pills every day, had a, I had a guy had a, uh, had a uh, stopwatch that had when he was supposed to take all these pills. Um, I had a, I had a, HIV, a, a girl born to a mother who was, um, who it was HIV positive and I had to make up the medication and a liquid back then for the child so that she you know she did not progress to have HIV. So it's still the attitude of these young people. Um, and, and somebody could address that. It, it's they want the they want the result of being right now, all I have to do is to take this pill and I'll be all right. So how do we unlearn these these young people that it is a light is going to be a lifelong taking this one pill um, go ahead so that's one of the things that um 
Magic Johnson has done for our community. You know, they're looking at Magic Johnson. Okay, he's not playing basketball anymore, but he's a multi-billionaire. But we need to remember since day one, he has had access because of his finances and everything else. He had immediate access to treatment, care, and the best of the best of everything. So those, those are some of the things we need to look at. Like, you know, the same way we tell our kids, you know, he might be a great basketball player in high school. That doesn't mean you're going to the NBA. So you got to kind of look at he's in a different situation. I, I think, again, it goes back to, you know, educating these young people. You know, I, I'm, I'm a family doctor, so I take care of all life cycles. But a lot of kids, they go to pediatricians. I just don't see the pediatricians having these types of conversations with their adolescent and teenage patients, um, even the ones that they um, have identified as maybe being in a high risk uh, situation in terms of their behaviors. So we're gonna have to target educating these young people at different levels, you know, within the school system, within their healthcare uh, setting uh, and within our churches. You know, I, I think that it is extremely important. All the issues that are plaguing the black community, that needs to be on the list of efforts in a black church. You know, people go to church uh, when they don't go anywhere else, you know, and uh, as far as why it is affecting the black community more, it's not hard to see. I mean, when we look at COVID and this pandemic, we were disproportionately affected by COVID. COVID is a virus. HIV is a virus. So it's the same um, uh, social determinants that have already been mentioned. It's those same things, access uh, to care, the type of care that a person gets. I mean, there are racial injustices within the healthcare system. There needs more, to be more providers uh, that look like me <laughs> that are treating uh, patients uh, that we're talking about right now. Well, thank you, Dr. Peace. I, I, wonderful. I think everybody did a wonderful job. And I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Tamara. So one question in the uh, chat was, what is the best way to bring up the conversation regarding disclosure to potential partners? Did anybody answer that question? I'll take a stab at it. I think okay. I can do that. Um, so. Um, um, you know, just honestly, um, you know, we were talking about some of the things that, um, you know, that come on TV and stuff like that. Um, I, I, I tell my I tell my people um, this one, you know, you can always when a commercial comes on, you can always ask your partner like, hey, how do you feel about this commercial? And you'll always be able to tell whether they're either uneducated um, and you need to have that conversation right then. Or you know whether they're ready to have the conversation or not. Um, but another thing is, uh, you know, I tell people that one of the easiest routes, especially for those who are on dating apps and things of that nature, is to honestly just go ahead and put your status up there. Because if they go, if you go ahead and put your status up there and they contact you for communication, um, if they read properly, you know, you can bring it up in conversation. Hey, did you read? you know, my, my stats, did you read what was going on? Um, but, you know, I, I'll just share from personal, just a personal story. Um, one of the things that I share with my partner, we had met, we had been uh, dating for probably about three weeks. Um, kind of, we're really not dating, but spending time together. Um, and so um, I asked him, I said, you know, I said, um, I need to have a serious conversation with you. What's the worst thing that you can handle? And um, his reply was um, lying and cheating. And I was like, oh, okay, that's it. I'm like, well, too easy. So, you know, I, I, then told him, I said, well, I want to share with you what I feel like is the worst thing in my life currently. Um, you know, and I shared, you know, I'm HIV, I'm HIV uh, positive, I'm undetectable because by the time I had met him, I had been on medicine for over a year, um, my, my um, medication for over a year. And so, um, you know, my, my thought pattern was, um, I told him, I said, um, you don't have to answer me today. I said, you really can't go home and think about it. I said, honestly, I said, now I'll be honest. I said, if, you, if it's something you can't handle or deal with, my feelings might be a little bit hurt. But what I'd rather is to have an honest conversation now than to get later on down, down the road. And then I'm really in my little feelings because it's something that we can't handle that you can't deal with. I, I say, honestly, um, you know, 
if if at much as much as possible when it comes to disclosing your relationships and stuff like that um try to invo- try to avoid being sexual starting out you know of course get to know a person first um and then it makes it easier to have conversations later um as far as it concerns your family friends and other people you don't have to disclose unless you're ready and willing to have that conversation um you know I I say that it's best to disclose because it provides you some type of support system but ma'am sir please gauge you know um and you know if you pray be prayerful about who you should and should not share with and I hope I gave some well-roundedness to that Thanks, Siobhan. And one other question that was in there, it was talking about Veterans Affairs. Tamara gave some good information um, if you want to contact about Veteran veteran Affairs. Um, But what type of relationships do you have with the Veteran Administration um, Facility Veterans who have a dishonorable discharge or some type of conditional discharge and may not be eligible for VA services needing HIV AIDS treatment? I would think that that person should be able to get into Ryan White care. Mm-hmm. And when I say when I say Ryan White care, that means that if you don't have insurance, and my clinic, Southern Regional AHEC, is a Ryan White Part B clinic, um, what you will do is you will um, contact the clinic, or you can get a referral. You can get the um, VA um, to refer you to um, Southern Regional AHEC. Um, and what will happen is, is you will talk to either myself, Ms. Yvonne, or Erica McCray as a case manager here, and we will go through an assessment process with you. Um, we will submit those documents to the state and get you approved on HMAP, um, which is HIV Medication Assistance Program. Who I, I, we, we throw out so many acronyms in healthcare, <laughs> and I have to remember to say what they are. So we will get you involved in the um, HIV, HIV Medication Assistance Program. Um, and from there, you know, we will take it from there. And so all of your healthcare Um, for the most part, will be covered as long as we can get all the information that we need from you. Um, And let me help you out if you do, if you are a person uh, living with HIV and need Ryan White Care. um, When you come, please, if you um, would bring your pay source, how you get paid. um, And what that means is if you get paid every week, we need your last four check stubs because we do have to submit to the state. Um, If you two weeks every the last two and so forth and so on um bring your id with you and things of that nature um and we will get you engaged in care and that's for any other ryan white clinic if, if you're in robeson county robeson county has a ryan white clinic in that area i think scotland county now is taking a few people in the area but um i think we are one of the larger areas and we do serve seven counties and i might have said it wrong, might be nine but yes we will get you engaged in care Yeah, I think it's important to note, uh, and I work at a Ryan White funded clinic as well, uh, that, I mean, in the state of North Carolina, anyone that is HIV positive, they could be on medicine. So you should not be dying from AIDS in 2022. Uh, The medications are free (laughs) to, all you have to do is, like he said, sign up, come to the clinic so that we can see you and monitor you. Uh, there, there just should not be uh, people dying from AIDS now. Uh, the life expectancy of someone that's living with HIV is, is virtually the same as someone that's not infected with HIV. Uh, and I tell my newly infected patients that, uh, you know, anything that you wanted to do before you found out you were HIV positive, you still can do. People don't know that, you know, at, for women, you can still have babies uh, when you're HIV positive and the baby will be HIV negative if you are on medicine and undetectable. That needs to be said in this setting uh, because there are just a whole lot of people that they don't know even that. Can I just really interject y'all. there? Can I just interject there? Amen. I have gotten <laughs> married since being HIV positive. I have finished my doctoral degree since being HIV positive and I plan to make some little kills after being HIV positive. Listen, you can live a perfect life. Um, my husband is not HIV positive. Um, as a matter of fact, just, you know, not to give you too much of my business, but, you know, um, from when we first started dating, we used, of course, contraceptives, all that great stuff. Um, but for a little while, we practiced you equals you. My husband uh, now is on PrEP, but he wasn't on PrEP uh, um, at first 
because I was with the undetectable status. So you can have a perfectly normal life. Just make sure that you get engaged in care and take your medications. Listen, and if you don't know your status, and as one of the, both of the doctors I think said earlier, and you've ever had any unprotected sex, ma'am, sir, my siblings, whatever you go by, I need you to understand, go get a test. <laughs> it's just the test and the yeah. worst you can find out is that either you are living without HIV or that you are living with HIV and, 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 and even living with HIV is not a worse thing because all you need to do is get engaged in care and let's get you healthy and get you living and thriving. I'm done. Are you positive that you're negative? All right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We would like to say that's preachery. <laughs> I That's told you I'm a preacher's kid, so I get it naturally. Yes. I'm a PK kid too. Yes, I understand. Um, but we would like to thank all of our participants for joining us today in this great conversation that needed to be had. Um, this webinar has been awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to say thank you to our presenters and panelists for their expert knowledge and information provided today. Um, and we thank you to, uh, we want to say thank you to all of you. We hope that today's event has highlighted ways we can prioritize health equity and strengthen collaborations to support HIV prevention and sustain care for those living with HIV. All right, so um, we encourage walk-in testing um, and this can be done at the Cumberland County Department of Public Health. If you would like to get tested for HIV, we encourage you to visit the Cumberland County Department of Public Health. Testing is free and confidential today. And today in recognition of uh, uh, National Black, hold on, NBHAAD walk-ins are available. And if you would like to make an appointment, call 910-433-3600. That's 910-433-3600. Now I wanna remind each of you that this is a two-part series that um, we're, we're putting together. So please join us on March the 10th, March the 10th for National Women and Girls HIV and AIDS Awareness Day. That will be part two of our awareness series. And that time will be from 4.30 p.m to six, six o'clock p.m. So we thank you, thank you, thank you. If you have any more questions, we have um, a lot of emails in the chat. If you need to get in touch with somebody, they love uh, phone numbers, email addresses. So there's plenty of ways to get in touch with everybody. And we wanna thank you again, and we want you to have a great afternoon.